Director Lohne Scherfing usually works only twice, maybe with the same composer. She worked with Rachel Portman, Kaspar Windig. So why did she chose you? It's, um, yes, it's interesting working with Lona. Uh, her scores for those other films were fantastic, and I was always a big fan of her films and the music she wrote for them. So yeah, I was very lucky to be chosen to to work on this. And I, I, I don't know. You know, there was a a group of different countries that were involved, and um, we had a lot of discussions about the style of music and my history of of uh, orchestra writing along with a unique approach to it based on my travels. So um, I think she had heard the score uh, Siddharth as one of them and um, I was lucky enough to get the call. So she was the one who approached you? She was, yes. Um, you know that she's part of the Dogma 95 movement and one of the rules was the sound must never be produced apart from images or wise versa. So music must not be used unless it occurs where the scene is being shot. What are your thoughts on that? It's interesting. I hadn't heard that, but having worked with her, it uh, I see that that's true. You know, in, in the kindness of strangers, it, the approach to the music was really interesting because we had an, an in in the fact that the characters are hearing this beautiful romantic classical music in the concert hall in New York City and they're on the outside listening in and that was really a key to the score and a lot of the score really originates the themes really originate at that moment where the characters are actually hearing the music and thus it's it's really synonymous with their characters from that point on in the film um. You dismantled a um, piano for San Andreas. What did you do for Kindness of Strangers? Yes, interestingly, very different movies. But um, the dismantling of the piano in San Andreas, what was funny about that is the whole purpose of, of the exercise of doing that was to imitate the breaking of the wires on the Golden Gate Bridge in the film. And when I did it, and working with Brad, the director, we thought that would be the interesting sound, was breaking it. But having scheduled two days for breaking the piano, at the end of the first day, I sat down in my studio and thought, I'm just going to start playing this instrument and see what happens. And it was extraordinary. It was this amazing half, we called it the dying piano, in that certain strings worked, certain strings were missing, so the, the hammer of the piano would hit the soundboard and make it kind of a percussive instrument. And thus, It, it took on a life that I hadn't expected and ended up being an instrument I used in the film. What's interesting is it actually really changed my approach to film scoring, where I, I had, um, having worked with Michael Dana for many years, had really under, come to understand world music and exploring different elements of world music around the world and different cultures. And also my, my background in orchestral music had also given me this other orchestral stream. But I started to try to find musical sounds in places in between those two streams. And so for the kindness of strangers, although it's an orchestral score, um, it's very much influenced by my experimenting with other instruments, just in terms of the textures of the orchestra and a lot of the writing. Did you use or try to find a special instrument? We did. You know what? I used some instruments that I have in my collection. One, um, I call it an octo euclid, which is this large um, six or seven foot um, resonant box with piano wire strung across it. I used it a little bit and I used um, some of the instruments. I had some metals and some other instruments that I had done, um, found for a movie called um, The Space Between Us, a Peter Chelsom film. So I played around with those things a little bit. Interestingly, although I used them for writing, they ended up not being in the film as much, but it, the, the, um, the echoes of them are in the orchestral writing. So it really influenced how I wrote for the orchestra. Um, and coming back to the director, um, how does Dogma You talked a little about it, reflected on her working style and on her co collaboration with you. It's a good question. You know, um, her style of filmmaking is really unique. And as a composer, 
Um, it's funny, I met the cinematographer last night for the first time, Sebastian, and I was telling him that all of the imagery that he and Lona do is it's like a painting. Like every frame looks like a painting in the way it, there's, a, there's a, almost a visual music to the, to the way they shoot it. So I talked to Lona about it and I know she, she has this real sense of music in her head. And the great thing about Lona as a director is the ultimate film experience for me is when you walk away from a movie having experienced all the visual and audio as one. You don't, you aren't able to separate the elements. And I think that's something that is, is a consistent part of her work through all of her films. She has a, a real gift for combining the audio, the visual, the music, the sound design, the um, color timing of the film, the, the way it's shot. You know, it's, it's all really one experience in the end. At what stage of the production were you approached? You know, I came on quite late, actually, in the production, so they were very close to done editing, and um, we were scoring about five weeks later after I was hired, so it was very fast. And I presume she had temp music in it? She did. She actually, it was interesting. When I was approached, the scenes I was talking about where there's the concert hall, she had uh, orchestral music, Smetna, Moldau, you know, some Strauss. She had this um, romantic classical music that she had, that had really influenced her and influenced the characters. So some of that we replaced with my themes that are written and orchestrated and presented in such a way to sound authentic, like they're coming, they would be appropriate to the time period, appropriate to what the Philharmonic would be playing. Um, and some of it remained um, the traditional orchestral music. What are your thoughts on temp music, since a director can fall in love with them? Yeah, my thoughts tend to change day to day. It really depends on the project. Um, there are projects where someone will temp something in that's from a, a $2 million dollar score that is impossible to replicate. Um, and that can cause problems, that can really pigeonhole you. On the other hand, You know, when there isn't, when, a, when a, a director doesn't have an idea of temp and what they're doing, um, then while it's a blank canvas for the composer, you can have numerous false starts. You can go down several different paths and get into writing two or three different scores, essentially. So I've come to, especially with the directors I work with, I've come to actually appreciate it. I actually think it's really, it's helped me. and. The best scenario is when I'm brought on early enough in a project that I can provide some temp music or suggest um, what my approach to the score is and then the music editor can go, okay, yes, let me see if I can find elements that are those textures and those sounds and use those. So in terms of my working process, I find that the best, the best hybrid approach. Which scene did you score first? In Lona's film, the first scene I scored was the opening, the very beginning of the film. Um, and yeah, it, it wasn't intentional. I had seen the whole thing. Um, it's just coincidentally the scene that spoke to me the most. And um, it's, there's very little dialogue in that scene, so there's, there's a lot of room for a, a statement and a thematic introduction in the music. And um, yeah, it, it's interesting. The whole film really resonated with me. It's, Especially in this time with the news, and it's hard to turn on the news and see anything good happening in the world. And um, there's an, it's a, it's a really hard, the characters are in really difficult situations in this film, but you find hope and kindness and, I don't know, there's, there's something very, there's an optimism to the film, even in the really dark situations that happen that, that really spoke to me. And musically, that's something we really focused on is, you know, there are times in the film where the characters are in really terrible situations and the music almost represents the opposite of where they are. It represents where they hope to be one day or the life they dream of. And as the film goes on, part of the character arc, they actually arrive where that music actually represents them. It, it is their reality. Um, so it was a really interesting way to work and, And it was really nice to, to write hopeful 
music, and especially in the context of, of the film, because you really root for these characters. You love these characters, and you really hope, hope they can pull out of their situation. This time you have seen the whole film before you started. What did you usually need for inspiration? And then what is your working style? Did you are on sitting next to a piano and started playing some music or synthesizer? It, it's funny you mentioned that. It was piano in this case. I, um, I just sat down at a piano and started playing themes. And Lona and I were not in the same country. We got very good at FaceTime. Uh, going back and forth and sit putting the, the phone on the piano and saying, okay, what about that? I was running around my studio to different instruments and playing her different things. Um, I remember at one point she said to me, she said, wow, how, how do you, I was actually playing something on the keyboard and she said, how do you stand that? Your keyboard is so loud. The notes are so noisy. And I realized I had put the phone right by the keys so what she was hearing was this clunk, 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 as opposed to the music. But um, yeah, I, I sat down at a piano and um, what I loved about working on this film is the, the approach was orchestral. It was always orchestral. That's the color that we were looking at. But it's the first pure orchestral score I've done since traveling through Papua New Guinea, since traveling you know, through different parts of Melanesia and studying all these different cultures of music and also acquiring all these unique instruments. So it completely changed the way I looked at the piano writing and the way I looked at the, the orchestra writing. And um, I'm not sure how much of that the audience will pick up on, but it, it was great for me because it almost felt like I was sitting down with a new instrument. Um, and generally, uh, where do you start on what instrument? It varies depending on the film. Um, sometimes piano, sometimes guitar, a lot of times humming into my phone and voice memos, um, which if anyone ever checks your email, ends up being really awkward because you've got all these cryptic messages. Especially, you know, sometimes I'll be humming and I'll, I'll hum in arpeggios because I'm trying to hum held notes of all the different instruments and really doesn't sound flattering for anybody. But um, yeah, it, 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 every movie is different. It's, I find you almost have to put aside the process and not think about the process, not think about um, the medium you're writing on and just sort of let it, let it happen naturally. The best things happen when you don't think about it and you just sort of allow yourself to get lost in the creative and in the story. And um, you sort of suddenly come to and realize, oh, where did the last three hours go? Where did this come from, kind of thing. So that's, that's the most fun, and that, I think that's usually the most productive. How about mock-ups, since um, there is no instrumentation, nothing? Are directors more disappointed when they hear the final song? Yes, so mock-ups are hugely important. It's a really interesting phenomenon, because I know when I was starting out and prior to me, a lot of composers would write an entire score on piano and sort of say to the director, hey, this part will be woodwinds, and then this will be the double basses come in and the timpani, and it's all piano, and it, it required so much imagination on behalf of the director and the producers and the studio. And as time goes on and our mock-ups get better, even for composers, your imagination gets worse because As you get closer to it, people stop imagining and thinking, yeah, I hear flute, but it'll be a better flute, but no. So in some ways, as much as you need mock-ups, in some ways they start to pigeonhole you into sounding a certain way. Um, Lona wasn't like that. Lona has, uh, you know, I think she's had experiences with other composers where they do sit at the piano. Um, so starting out that way with her and playing the themes She was right in there, right on board, totally understood what I was thinking, could imagine it. And then when I was able to play it for her with the orchestral mock-up, I think having had the previous exercise of sitting at a piano and having her imagine really helped us. How much music did you compose for the film? I think in the end, just over 40 minutes, about 42 minutes of music were composed for the film. And how about placing the music? Is it so when all the scenes 
that you discussed with her? Yes. It, it, in terms of our spotting, the music was almost exactly what we planned. Um, there were a few places, there were a few cues that we tried um, using in additional places, little reprises of elements that, um, and that we used in a few other spots in the film. Lona has an amazing team of, of filmmakers that she's worked with a few times before. One, is, one of them is the um, sound designer and mixer named Hans Moeller. Um, and this was the first time I'd ever met Hans. And uh, as a composer, I'm used to working with the director, you know, pretty one-on-one. -on -one. Hans came into the process and, and offered ideas and he was amazing. He, I was incredibly impressed at, at his musicality and his ability to communicate and to understand what we were doing. And, and he brought some really great ideas to the table, just in terms of, of shifting the placement of a cue or, or coming out of a cue for a moment or you know, shortening an element or lengthening an element or reprising an element. Um, it's the first time I've had that experience actually with a mixer bringing that much to the creative process. And I understand now why he's such a trusted member of Lona's team. I think there are about uh, 10 songs in the film. Um, did you know the songs or did you, they change them? So in your mind, um, I have to think about the songs because they are also influencing the sound. Yeah, the, when I first saw the film, some of the songs were the same, some were, some were different. Um, in the end, uh, David Heyman, the music supervisor, stuck with a very similar sound. I think it was pre-established what, uh, you know, the, especially the Russian element. There's a, a Russian restaurant in the film. So there's some live music in the film that's playing that has this Russian influence. Um, so that was important. And it, it only slightly creeps into the score. Um, it's fun actually at the end there's a balalaika that makes a, a very brief appearance in the score that um, is relevant to the story and makes sense only because of its, its relevance in the, the music. One, one thing that did change which was interesting when I first watched the film Bill Nye, his character is sitting at the piano in the restaurant and sits down and starts playing and the piece he was playing wasn't something they wanted to use. It was sort of a placeholder. And Lona and I came up with the idea of, wouldn't it be amazing if he was playing our theme from the film and we really tie in this element. And there's another place where there's a student orchestra playing and they are playing the theme and trying to really marry some of the source music in the film with the score. Um, I have to say, probably one of the most challenging things I've ever had to do was match Bill Nighy's movements with an original score, a theme of, you know, that we've already written and established in the film and trying to figure out, you know, as he's playing, does, you know, when it goes down here and when he leans over here, it was a challenge. And actually, it was funny, I remember, I thought, wow, you know, three days sitting at the piano trying to make this work, finally nailed it. And then, I can't remember if it was the editor, somebody said, oh, we think we should wait a second and start the theme like three seconds later. So we've just moved your music three seconds later, but it doesn't quite match now. Is there any way you can figure out how to... It was quite funny. It actually worked out perfectly in the end, and it was a fun challenge, but maybe the toughest, toughest technical challenge I've had. About toughness, I learned that sometimes a composer has to put out 40 different themes for one scene. How about you? Never 40, thank goodness. Um, sometimes you sometimes you have to try a few things. It's it's interesting because I think as a composer we do that anyways. We we don't sit down and write one theme and say this is it. it it's absolutely this. Play it for the director, and the director says this is it. I think there is a process of elimination as a composer where you. I mean, I think it's a lot like a band or a, a recording artist where they'll go into a studio with. 30 song ideas and end out up with their best 10. You know, I think sometimes a composer goes in with multiple ideas themselves and edits them down and then decides what they're looking for. So sometimes you can bring the director into that process if you trust them and say, hey, I'm, I'm trying to decide between these few ideas. Um, 
with Lona, I mean, we had a very short amount of time. I was, I was pretty sure the first theme I wrote for that opening scene, I was really happy with and pretty sure that was the approach I wanted to take. And fortunately, she liked it right away and we, we connected with that one. For the most part, they all came pretty quickly with her film. Um, back to 40, I'm, I, I feel bad for that composer and would love to buy him or her a drink for sure, because uh, that would be rough. That was uh, James Newton Howard for the presentation of Fantastic Beasts and where to find them yeah. for the opening sequence oh, really? with the logo, yeah. You know, James, uh, I was at a dinner where James was speaking and he, he said to all the composers in the room, it was really nice to meet all the other people who are rewriting cues on a daily basis. Um, so it's, it's nice to hear that we all go through that, that process. Why was the score for Kindness of Strangers recorded in London? I um, have been really lucky to record a lot of scores in London. When I, when I heard, um, or sorry, when I saw Lona's film, I immediately called her up and said, you know, the, the studio that I imagine this score at is Air Lindhurst. And I'd recorded there many times and there's just, there's a, There are different reverbs at all, of all these rooms and as, as a composer, and I think much of film audiences, if, if, they were, if it, it was brought to their attention, they would pick up on the different sounds and characters of, of you know, Air Lindhurst, of Abbey Road, of Sony, of you know, all these different studios, the Newman stage in LA. They would start to recognize, oh yeah, I get that character, I hear these similarities in these scores. But, but of all of those, Air Lindhurst has a really unique, almost a whispering reverb to it when, when you record strings in that room. And I don't know, it, it just spoke to me right away. And I had done a score there maybe a year and a half ago, um, similar instrumentation. And I sent it to uh, Lona and said, I kind, this, this is the sound I kind of hear. And she immediately said, yeah, for sure. Now, serendipitously, there is actually a church in the film Lona pointed out to me, um, the, there's a church in the film that the architecture of it is so similar to air, it almost felt like she said to me, she said, well, it was meant to be, because you can see I already had the church in my mind and it's the same, so um, it all worked out. Some European composers at least are very itchy when it comes to um, recording, and some prefer Prague because I know it's like more symphonic or more strings. Others go to Budapest and Sofia. Does the audience recognize that, just like you said with the recording studios? It's a good question. I, I think it ends up being an important ingredient in the recipe. And whether they recognize the ingredient or they just recognize the finished recipe, um, I think it's significant. I think it ends up being important. Recording different places around the world. I mean, we're very fortunate. There's incredible orchestras. There's incredible options as composers. All of these places, you you have, you know, num one one A, one B, one C. They're all at the top of the podium. They're all very good. But I, there are subtle differences in depending in different places where you record. And you're absolutely right. I mean, Prague has a real orchestral background. Um, real classical background. London is interesting. I find the orchestra is very literal. They look at the notes on the page and um, the dynamic markings, any of the musical language is really, really important. They don't approach it with a classical approach. I think they really look at it as a blank canvas and are waiting for you to add all of the colors. And, and Los Angeles, you know, it's interesting. I think they're so used to film music that their immediate instinct is to sort of give it a traditional film music approach and then you work from there. You either work backwards or forwards. So um, many scores I've done, I'd say the majority I've done in London and I know the players pretty well. I know the style. Um, there's a comfort level for me and um, my um, engineer um, collaborator for many years, Andrew Dudman, works at Abbey Road, so he's close. Um, yeah, there's a, there are a lot of elements that um, 
Nicholas Dodd, who's an orchestrator that I've worked with many times, is based in London. So there's a lot of elements that, uh, that just offer a comfort level for me. Why didn't you conduct your own music or play at least the piano in the score? Well, I did play some piano in the score. Um, the conducting's an interesting question. I used to. When I first started out, I would conduct, and when I worked with other composers as, orchestration, as an orchestrator, I would conduct those scores. It's definitely my favorite place to be conducting, although having worked with some of the best conductors in the world, I think I'm more intimidated than I used to be standing in front of an orchestra. But it, I, I compare conducting an orchestra of that caliber to driving a Ferrari. It's, it's um, an amazing experience, but at the end of the day, the important element when you're writing music for film is how it's working with the film. And the only way for me to really judge that is to be in the booth with the, with the director, looking at the picture and really concentrating on how it is going to, uh, how it is being recorded, what it's sounding like. I mean, you can sit, when you stand out in the concert hall, despite all the 7.1, the 192 kilohertz, the 32-bit, all these amazing sounds, these incredible speakers, nothing sounds like it does when you're in the room. Nothing does. But the only experience that you're going to be able to give your audience is how it sounds on the, on the film, through the speakers, through the sound system. So I sort of feel I'm the shepherd of that and I need to make sure that that is the best it can be. And unfortunately that, for me, requires sacrificing the enjoyment of being up in front of the orchestra and hearing your music in the room. Um, now other composers I know, and I think if I had the opportunity and budget-wise, I'd love to try conducting and then take breaks and run into the booth and hear it and be able to sort of wear two hats in that way. But um, a lot of times budget-wise, you're moving so fast and, and the benefit of being in the booth is that time that it would normally take to run in and listen, you can actually get another take and solve some of the issues you had. Will there be a soundtrack release for Kindness of Strangers? There will. Um, it, the details are still being sorted um, as to whether it will be score only or score and source, and also um, when it will be released, which I think will correspond with the release date, which has to be determined still. How many people were in the orchestra? So the orchestra was um, mostly strings. We had four horns as well, a brass element, and Lona and I, interestingly, both had the same aversion to woodwinds on this score. We both um, reacted to it in the same way in, in the context of this film. But I pitched her the idea of alto flutes, of three alto flutes as an element, and it really worked nicely. Just it, The piercing quality was gone. It, it's, it really adds as a texture to the strings, and then when it needs to be a flute for flute's sake, it, um, it does so in less of a spotlight kind of way. Um, so the size, it was a good size, I can't remember the numbers exactly, but it was a good size group. Um, you worked for Netflix and you are still working for them and many see Netflix and Amazon Prime and I don't know, Google Movies, <laughs> Google Play as a threat for cinema. What are your thoughts on that? It's, a, it's an interesting question. It's, um, I have many different thoughts. I, I love the experience of, of seeing a film with an audience and seeing it, you know, sometimes it's with an audience, sometimes it's on a big screen. Um, I'm a little bit terrified when I hear my own scores just through a laptop speakers and I'm always telling producers and directors when they listen to something, please put on headphones, please make sure you don't just listen through the laptop speakers because you're missing so many, so much of the musical spectrum, musical frequencies. On the other hand, having worked on a bunch of projects with Netflix, I see there's a, there's a great respect for filmmakers and, and a sort of an arm's length of allowing them to do their thing and put their team together and tell their story. And there, I think there's an empowerment that happens for a, for a storyteller and for a filmmaker when they're given that kind of trust. Um, There's also, you know, this project I just did um, with Richie Mehta, Delhi Crime Story, uh, which was at Sundance a few weeks ago, 
which will be picked up, will be on Netflix. Originally, it was it was supposed to be a film, and he had written the screenplay as a as a film, and there's no way that story could be told in two hours. It really needs the five or six hours that is the seven episodes of the story, and so obviously it it instantly takes out the medium of of theater for that. So I think there are advantages and disadvantages, but. You know, it is the direction we're moving in, and I, I have to say, some of some of the most exciting storytelling is is happening in this medium. Richie said something really interesting um, last week, and he said he really hopes that when they talk about something being a a film or a TV series, that TV gets dropped from that moniker at some point because it should just be film or t or series. You know, it because TV sort of relates it to a medium that is different now, you know, this exactly 43 minutes an episode, exactly, you know, once a week told, you know, over the course, getting a chapter once a week over the course of three months or six months. And I think, I think it's moving in a different direction where people are actually, and, and actually, you know, just to digress for a minute, when I score something like that, like when I scored Richie's latest project, I score it as if I would score a film. I have themes that are carrying on from the beginning of the six hours to the end, and there's an evolution of the music that is is being written and presented in such a way that I'm expecting people to watch it in one in one path and not to watch it one hour a week, you know. So so there's a different approach to it in that sense, and and I love that. It's 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 interesting as a composer. Sometimes you know, an hour and 40 minutes or two hours isn't enough to really explore all of the possibilities around a theme of variations and how it evolves. So um, it can be a real luxury to have that as a composer and write these themes and really explore different tangents, allow them to go off the rails a little bit, but then continue on the natural evolution of a melody. Um, so I'm not sure if that makes sense, but um, I think for the most part it's a good thing. In terms of storytelling, it's a good thing. How about um, stepping stone in a career because you get instantly worldwide recognition? Is it better than just uh, scoring a Hollywood blockbuster? It's a good question. I don't, I don't know. I, 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 maybe to be seen. It's, it's definitely hard to ga harder to gauge the exposure that something gets when it's streaming. You know, it's harder to know how much people are responding to it and how much they're seeing it. Um, but again, I'll say, you know, there's there's some incredible music coming out of that medium. I mean, Stranger Things is a great example. Um, there's really, I think, the same trust that filmmakers are getting and the ability to explore their storytelling is being passed along to composers to be able to to try new things. And it's a, it's a different kind of pressure. I think it's... a an internal pressure to to be great, which we always have, of course. But but it's because the the Netflix and those those streaming platforms are a little bit removed and sort of giving a trust to the storytellers. I think there's I don't know. It's 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 a different it's a different beast and a different challenge for composers to explore something they might not have had the freedom to explore in certain scenarios in film. What can you tell me about um, Daybreak? Daybreak is really fun. It's filming right now. It's um, based on a graphic novel by the same name called Daybreak. And it's um, a post-apocalyptic uh, story shortly after the apocalypse about a group of high school students in Los Angeles. And the story follows their journeys after the apocalypse and flashes back to their relationships before the apocalypse. Um, one of the stars is Matthew Broderick, which is really fun because the show really has a little bit of a nod to, to Ferris Bueller and the talking to the camera and um, that sort of vibe. Um, so it's really cool to have him in it and I'm a huge fan of, of Matthew's. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, It's, I mean, it definitely fits in the context of the Netflix, the trust, doing something really original, something that you've never seen before, this sort of combination of 
ideas, this dramedy, um, it's, it's really shaping up to be fantastic. How did you two met? Brad and myself. Um, I had scored this movie Journey to the Center of the Earth with Brendan Fraser and the director at the time, Eric Brevig, was originally supposed to do the second movie and because of schedule conflicts couldn't do it. He was finishing another film. So they hired Brad Payton to do it. And I went in and met with Brad and was fortunate to be one of three people, I guess, that were carried over from the first film to the second. And we, we actually hit it off right away. We're both, we both grew up in the same era of Spielberg, John Williams collaboration films, and both um, remembered renting VHS tapes, you know, and putting them in the machine and watching them over and over until they were due, you know, until the next day when you had to have it back by a certain time. Um, we both we both really connected in terms of music being an emotional and such an important emotional element to every scene but not necessarily just reiterating what what a scene is saying visually so we connected in that way and ironically it was only after we'd known each other I think for a few months that we realized we were both Canadian and both had so many contacts in common because we really had no idea I leave it to the two Canadians to not hear the other Canadians' accent, I guess. But um, yeah, he's he's become a good friend, and and it's a really safe place to work with him because I'll I'll approach him with really crazy ideas, and it's okay to be wrong. But that's how some of our best ideas have have come about. Is we both will say, hey, this sounds crazy, but what if we did this? Or this sounds crazy, what if we did this? So yeah, it, it's it's a really fun collaboration with him. It's a lot of work and I think we make sure that we go down every single path and figure out that we make sure there's not a better way of doing something. Um, but it's a really enjoyable process and he really loves getting in there and rolling up his sleeves. And when we're working, like when we were working on Rampage, Every day, every other day, he was in the studio with me, working, listening to music, coming up with ideas. Um, it's a very hands-on experience, and it's not like that with all directors. Um, and it's not to say it's worse or better, but um, I really enjoy the process with Brad. So how about Richie Mehta? Richie's um, a dear friend. Gosh, we've known each other, I think, about 10 years, and I scored... Um, his film Siddharth and also I'll Follow You Down and um, yeah similar I guess to Brad in that you know he's very he's a real music lover um, loves film um, he's in a different part of the industry so his influences are probably different than some of Brad's influences I mean they're kind of different styles of filmmaking um, the, the latest project Uh, Delhi Crime Story with Richie had, was editing for a long time. It was it was editing for almost a year, and so I had just finished Rampage, and they were just starting editing. And I I had sort of this post production schedule where I thought, okay, we're going to be in post for really soon, and I we'll have our delivery dates, etc. And then he had had a bit of a reimagining of the way he was editing, and it added months to the process. But I had already written a bunch of music. So I said, hey, Richie, take this, and um, you know, here's what I'm thinking. And unbeknownst to me, he took it and started using that music in editing. And he and the editor, Bev Mills, who's a genius editor, started, started using the music as temp. So when I started getting the episodes back, they had, um, you know, they were 70 or 80% my music that I had written for the show. It was an amazing way to work, and they ended up editing picture to a lot of the music. I mean, how cool is that as a composer that they're actually changing picture for your music and choosing the length of the scene based on your music. So that was a really fun way to work. And I ended up replacing some of the 80% and rewriting things, but it gave the show a real signature sound because, it, you know, back to your conversation about temp earlier, There wasn't, there was no other score being referenced. There was nothing else that we were thinking of or that they were thinking of in their head. It was just something I had come up with from reading the script and seeing some dailies. 
So it was a really interesting way to work. Now I've heard of this process completely backfiring and not working for a lot of people. So I'm not sure I'll be pursuing it in every project. But um, with Richie in this case, it was, it was an amazing process. You worked on Hollywood blockbusters, and I think the audience is accustomed to wall-to-wall -wall music in those type of genre. And the day before yesterday, I went to the screening of Captive State, and I expected music for every second of the film, but it wasn't there. So what are the pros and cons of wall-to-wall -wall music? Um, I tend to think there aren't any pros. I think one of the most effective parts of music and storytelling is the moment it comes in and the moment it leaves and the moments it changes. And I think if, if you're wall-to-wall -wall music, you, you lose some of your tools in, in helping the storytelling with the beginning and the end of the cue. Um, and I think a lot of times it's, it's funny, I worked for, I did a project called Pirate's Passage for Donald Sutherland years ago that he both wrote, directed, and starred in. And he and I had a lot of conversations about acting and music. And I said to him, you know, a really good actor is, is portraying their character and bringing everything to the table. And so how does, how does a really good actor feel when they've put all this effort into crafting a performance and the composer comes in and adds a different angle or a different perspective to what they're doing. And his response surprised me. He said, oh, we love it, because even though we, we um, have aimed for that, we never feel we nailed it. So the music kind of helps take it that extra little bit. But I can imagine other actors don't feel that way. Like, they might act a scene in a certain way, and the music will flavor it in a completely different way than they intended. So I feel that, you know, it's really important that the music you hope that the music isn't having to compensate for something that isn't there in the performance or in the storytelling. And in an ideal world, the music can be a parallel telling of the story and try to make connections in the story that aren't necessarily there visually or maybe things that were there in the script where you can sense that these characters have a symbiotic relationship even though they're not on the screen at the same time and maybe the music can use the same theme to connect them in a way that they weren't able to do in the storytelling. But a lot of times it's restraint. You know, a lot of times it's like finger painting. If, if you have a white sheet and you put red paint on the whole thing and you never put your fingers to clear it off, it's just a red sheet. It's, it, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it and maybe there's times it's appropriate, but I think you're missing an opportunity to have space and let it breathe. By the same token, it's funny, you watch a film There are scenes that might not call for music where you could really use a, an element of momentum um, and score it almost in the opposite way. So, yeah, I, it's, it's hard to make a blanket statement because every project is different, but I certainly never aim to have wall-to-wall -wall music, even on the blockbusters. I think, I think having space and allowing it to breathe is really important. You are not part of Hans Zimmer's remote control productions. Why not and were you approached to uh, join them? You know, I am a huge fan of everything that Hans has done and his approach to, to film music. I think he's done some incredible scores. I, um, I love being in the trenches and, and really writing everything and just being an author of everything I do. I, I, um, I see the advantage in other projects to have multiple people working on it. For me, I don't know, for my scores, I feel like, like handing anything off or bringing in a team um, would take away my control, and I'm a bit of a control freak in that way. I, and, and also take out some of the fun. I mean, some of the fun is really getting in the trenches and, and figuring it out. And, You know, there, often there'll be a, a really important scene in Act Three that musically is a, a super important moment. And how you hint at that when that theme appears in Act One and Act Two is hugely important. And if you're not intimate with that, in my scores, if I'm not intimate with that, I find, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have the same payoff. I can't, 
I can't understand the language of what I'm trying to do in quite the same way if I don't have the history with the music. Um, that said, you know, I think he's, he's done some incredible scores um, and, and his philosophy is great for a lot, of, a lot of projects and works really well. But uh, I guess for me it's a selfish thing. I, I'd rather work on less projects and, um, and be more absorbed in them and really live inside them. It's, really, it's a really cool thing, you know, when I was a kid growing up, when I used to write on the piano, my mother um, would sometimes rearrange the family room where our piano was and it would be in a completely different place. And I would find myself looking at the room in a different way or looking out a different window or a different scene. And in the music, I, I kind of realized in hindsight, I think I was scoring my life maybe when I was writing things because I was kind of looking, every time she'd move the piano, I'd have a different perspective and a different view and see things in a different way. And I guess, I guess songwriters do this when they go and travel and they'll go write in a different studio or they'll go you know, on a, on a camping trip and write a bunch of whatever. You know, it's, it's a similar idea. But I see films in the same way in that now when I, when I work on a film, I can kind of dive into a different world and see the, see the world in a different perspective for a few months. And I love that. I love, I love having that ability. So to, I guess I don't want to share that with anybody. I want to just sort of enjoy it and live in that world for the time period and then, and then leave it behind and move on to the next one. You have a long career now as a film composer. What changed technically for you over the years? Is it more challenging and more stressful now? And from a technical standpoint, you mean, or from just the process? From the process. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's more challenging. I think, I think they're all challenges you create for yourself. I think wanting to never repeat yourself. I think we're all, everyone in the film and, and series industry is like that. We don't want to do the same thing too many times. So when you're given a similar project, you want to find a whole new way of approaching it. Um, I also really like to paint myself in a corner sometimes musically, and I think that's what the different instrumentation and exploring different cultures of music helps me with. I remember when I was first, I had always played piano as a kid, and when I first got a guitar, an acoustic guitar, I had no idea how to play it. I, no one taught me three chords or taught me any chord fingering, so I kind of just looked at it as an instrument and figured it out. And there was a terror around that, for sure, but this euphoric result in that you figure out something really unique and original in terms of playing an instrument you've never played and you kind of use your skill to navigate through this new instrument and hopefully end up with music on the other end. I think I've, I've come to realize I love being in that situation. So I'm always trying to find a way on new projects to put myself in a slightly uncomfortable scenario where I can use unique instruments or a, a dying piano or found salvaged metals from a metal yard or you know ways to sort of force myself down a musical creative path that I might not have gone originally and it's a little bit like stone soup in that I don't know if you know that short story where you know they start making soup with the stone and and the guy brings the stone and says I'll contribute the stone then you guys all contribute something like a vegetable or some meat and all the townspeople contribute and then at the end he takes the stone out and they go wow this is amazing stone soup well a lot of times all these approaches in these instruments they may not they end up being taken out of the process in the end they might be pulled from the process in the end but they've really influenced the approach to all the other instrumentation and and how you get there and I love that part of the process. I mean, The Kindness of Strangers is an orchestral score primarily, but the way we got there was not from sitting down with manuscript and from a very traditional point. It was kind of approaching it from an uncomfortable place. And um, as such, I have a score that doesn't sound like any of my other orchestral scores. So yeah, in terms of the process, I think uh, for me as a composer, I'm, I'm trying to keep it uncomfortable in that sense and trying trying to force myself into doing something original and interesting and unique on each project.